Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is a special edition of The National in Washington. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. That's the promise. But today was also about the parade and the protests. As a new era begins, another ends. Our reporters have reaction from Washington, Ottawa, and around the world to Donald Trump's first day as President of the United States. Well, he took the oath of office, then stepped to the microphone. Donald Trump's first presidential chance to address both those who joyfully elected him and those who fear what he might do. A chance, perhaps, to mend fences in a country that split in two. But it turns out that candidate Trump's populist rhetoric wasn't just the stuff of campaigns, listing off all that he sees as wrong on jobs and inner cities, on education and crime, on trade and ISIS. The 45th president damned the Washington insiders seated right near him, then made a monumental and ironclad promise. He's going to fix it all. The CBC's Paul Hunter was watching, and he kicks off our extensive coverage tonight. Paul. Peter, President Donald Trump's inaugural address was aimed straight at those who voted him into power. To the millions in America's middle class, as he put it, this is your moment. Ladies and gentlemen, the president-elect of the United States, Donald John Trump. And out he walked, triumphant, fist pumping, set to take on the most powerful job on earth. For Donald Trump, one of the more unlikely ever to ascend to the White House, all that now stood in his way was that 35-word oath. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. And when it was done, the U.S. had its 45th president. A remarkable moment. Congratulations, Mr. President. But it's what he would say next to those watching in person and the millions watching around the world that's meant to frame his presidency. And Trump, as is his way, got straight to the point. Today, we are not merely transferring power from one administration to another or from one party to another, but we are transferring power from Washington, D.C., and giving it back to you, the people. It was the theme of his campaign and the heart of his inaugural address. His forceful message, old-style politics, are finished. Washington flourished, but the people did not share in its wealth. That all changes, starting right here and right now, because this moment is your moment. It belongs to you. As he did throughout last year's campaign, Trump painted a dark picture of America, not just abandoned factories, but inner city poverty, crime, gangs, drugs. On all of it, he said, This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. He didn't say how he'd keep his promises, though these speeches rarely dive into detail. And after an intensely bitter campaign, Trump faces a deeply divided country. Dozens of Democratic lawmakers boycotted the ceremony over questions that still dogged Trump on his campaign, his business ties, his behavior and demeanor. Though none of that mattered to most watching on in the crowd. To the countless wearing Trump's trademark red ball cap, today he spoke to them. Yes, together. We will make America great again. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. And now the hard part, Peter, living up to all of those promises. Well, one of those promises, Paul, is a big one, isn't it? Getting rid of Obamacare. 
Yeah, and he wasted little time on that. After the speech, there was the parade down Pennsylvania here to the White House and then straight into the Oval Office where President Trump signed an executive order targeting Obamacare. In its words, easing the economic burden. It's unclear exactly what that involves, but a Trump spokesman says, indeed, it's part of the transition to repeal and replace Obamacare, Barack Obama's signature legislation. Here we go. Here we go is right. All right, Paul, thanks very much. Hundreds of thousands of people watched the inauguration in person and lined the parade route. The vast majority support the new president, and we're in a mood to celebrate, but not all of them. Adrian Arsenault looks at that part of the story. No one will ever accuse Americans of being afraid to speak their minds. So sorry, Canada. It's not all of us. It'll be a quick four years. Protesters shoulder to shoulder with Trump supporters in checkpoint lineups, so deceptively civil early on. The peace of transfer of power is very, very important. We're all Americans. We right. have to live together right. and love each other. Past the checkpoints onto Pennsylvania Avenue and the parade route, the early arrivals so genuinely thrilled for this moment. I want to be able to take care of my family, and I want a better future. And really, he offered that, and I really believe in him. The same great American flag. This patch of Washington proved a touch awkward at times because for every cheering moment for the Trump supporters, cannot afford hopelessness. less than 200 meters away in one of the many official protest zones, there were flat out sobs at what this day means. Just hearing his voice, I can't, I can't take it. I think it's, a, I'm in more, I'm just so profoundly sad. Not all protesters got permits. Some didn't want to bother with them. Preferred to create chaos in the streets. More than 200 arrests, plenty of tear gas, six officers reportedly injured. Rare that inauguration see this much violence. Clashes just blocks from the White House seem to ebb and flow. Just when there was beginning to be a sense that maybe this was calming down, someone set fire to a car, people started running, and here come the riot police. An SUV and limo torched. Small fires had appeared all day. This upped the temperature, which, of course, was the point. When I say Trump, you say Trump, 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 Trump. Back inside the secure zone, no violence, but not always an easy escape from uncomfortable moments as the day wore on. Trump and anti-Trump forces not afraid to get in each other's faces. This is the nature of the game. No, yes. that's illegal. That's assault. Yes. They should, they should build separate. They should totally yes. separate. Yes. So they should, they should separate yes, children should. from their friends, make yes, them feel different. And between the cheers and jeers and divided loyalties, former President Barack Obama and his family flew away. Bye bye. <laughs> Many here not hesitant to say they won't miss him have a sense it's their turn now. Pennsylvania Avenue, like the United States itself, not exactly a place where common ground is easily found. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Washington. Well, so much to take in today. Keith Bogue is here again tonight to talk a little more about it. You know, a lot happened today, but in many ways it comes down to those 15 minutes of, of Trump speech. Uh, what's your takeaway of what he did say. Well, I think you said it earlier when you said it was like a campaign speech. It didn't really catch the moment. It wasn't what anyone would really compare to a traditional inauguration speech. It was a lot of the themes that we heard in the campaign. And in fact, it was dark in the same way that his convention speech mm -hmm. last summer was dark. People criticized him for that then, but you know, in his own mind, it didn't hamper his road to the White House. He still got here, and so why should he change it? But I. I listened to a couple of people, Republicans, both of them that I'm, I'm going to recall here. One woman who is a Trump supporter said that it sounded to her like Lincoln, like the Gettysburg Address. Mm -hmm. Another Republican woman who actually worked in the Reagan White House, Linda Chavez, said that she was shocked by the speech. She said it was an us versus them speech and that what Trump presented as patriotism was really just jingoism and that frightened her. What didn't he say? Everybody yesterday was looking to see what Trump was going to say to try to bring the country together. He didn't really say very much about that other than, you know, 
all Americans, no matter what color they are, bleed the same patriotic red blood. Well, sure. What he might have said, if he really wanted to bring the country together, he might have said something that, that acknowledged how many people voted against him, something that acknowledged the concerns they have about him, because they're no secret. You know, there, there has been a very, very divisive campaign of 18 months articulating those concerns. He didn't address any one of those things. He seemed very content instead just to stick to talking to the base in the way that he has All for right. 18 months. We'll leave it at that. Keith, thanks very much. Okay. Keith Bogue. Well, they weren't as violent as what we saw here in Washington, but a few protests flared up in other cities. We can't wait till the damage is done. So what are we going to do? We this from day one. What are we going to do? At least 100 people protested around New York's Trump Tower. A few were arrested for blocking traffic. In Mexico, as if an effigy of Trump weren't dramatic enough, a few demonstrators made comparisons to the Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan. But a protest in London had a different tone, including this message to the new president, draped over the side of Tower Bridge. The political tone in Canada is a mix of cautious optimism and uncertainty, with some big changes to the relationship likely to happen soon. Catherine Cullen looks at what the Canadian government is doing about it. Justin Trudeau is even recruiting big city mayors to help out with the U.S., asking them to reach out to their American counterparts. In ensuring that uh, everyone on both sides of the border understands the importance of continuing uh, to work constructively and productively. Which is a bit different than Donald Trump's tone. America first. The White House's newly updated website reaffirms some of Trump's plans. It mentions renegotiating NAFTA, perhaps even withdrawing something Trump warned about months ago. I intend to immediately renegotiate the terms of that agreement to get a better deal by a lot. Most of his attention has been on Mexico. Canadian officials in Washington right now are trying to paint trade with Canada as more win-win. When it comes to NAFTA, uh, we said from day one, our ambassadors said right after the U.S. election, that we were prepared to talk about modernizing NAFTA, improving it. But some fear Trump could scare companies away from Canada. Because no corporate CEO wants to be in, uh, Obama, in, uh, in Trump's crosshairs. There is at least one business opportunity, though, that could be revived. The Keystone XL pipeline would bring Alberta crude oil into the U.S. Barack Obama said no to the project. I want the Keystone pipeline, but the people of the United States should be given a piece, a significant piece of the profits. Canada's government says the company behind the project will have to decide whether to reapply. And I'm sure that if uh, the president gives the positive signal, that will be motivation. Uh, and we're supportive of the project. We think it's good for Canada. Then there's the fight against climate change. Obama and Trudeau have advocated for more international cooperation. Trump, not so much. We're going to cancel the Paris Climate Agreement and stop all payments of the United States tax dollars to UN Global Warming Program. In fact, that Trump update to the White House website got rid of the climate change page entirely. It's another sign that he and Trudeau are deeply out of sync on that issue. Peter? All right, Catherine, thank you. Well, in 2017, a transition of power involves a little more than handing over keys to the White House. Today at noon, the presidential Twitter account was given to Trump with all the followers but no posts. Barack Obama's tweets as president are now archived under another account. As for his tweets as a private citizen, he's gone back to being simply at Barack Obama. Coming up, President Trump has promised to run the country like a business. Why his cabinet picks back that up. He's also promised to build a wall but it won't be his first. It's awful, it's awful. Just feel as if I'm in prison now. With Donald Trump's warmer tone towards Russia, you can bet a few eyes in Moscow keenly watched the inauguration today, eager to see if a new era of U.S.-Russia relations is about to begin. Senior correspondent Susan Ormiston takes us there. You might not expect champagne at an inauguration party in the Russian capital for an American president. The office of President of the United States. But that's one of the polar shifts of Trump's election. 
Here's another. One vision of a leadership troika, Putin, France's Marine Le Pen, and Trump, that Maria Katasinova calls a new page unfolding for world history. Many Russians are hoping that the new U.S. president will help heal deep divisions between Moscow and Washington. I, I believe that it's possible because uh, Donald Trump um, is a businessman who decided very uh, complicated uh, problems of, uh, of, of the business. He titled his book on Trump, Black Swan. Support has grown here to 50% in the last two months. The future depends of uh, his uh, real political course. But the Kremlin is increasingly cautious. Trump speaks more gently towards Russia, but few can predict his style in government. And they right. wouldn't speak. Oksana Boyko is a host with Kremlin-funded RT, Russian television. If Donald Trump is willing to give it a fair treatment, I think we would be fine with that. We are not envisaging, you know, this rosy relationship that will allow us, you know, to rule over the world in concert, uh, you know, Moscow and Washington deciding the fates of other countries. Early this morning at a Moscow bar, Sergei Vertinsky crooned about the beautiful future ahead. He performed the same song for Donald Trump in Moscow back in 2013. Trump said it was his favorite Russian song. Um, he's a great guy. He's what a, how we call in Russia, in Russia, our guy. That means that when he enters the room, it's like just a sun coming in. You know, when he comes in, it's, you, you see that he's a boss. It's very easy to see. Then again, there's another president here who likes to be boss. Silence tonight from the Kremlin on President Trump's inauguration and his speech. The real politicking begins tomorrow. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Moscow. Among the policies posted online today by the new administration, a plan to build a missile defense system to protect the U.S. against attacks from North Korea and Iran. Our Nala Ayed is in the Iranian capital tonight with reaction there. Nala. Peter, Iranians will not be surprised to have been brought up so early in Trump's presidency because leading up to this, he has brought up Iran a lot. And because of his opposition to Iran's nuclear deal with world powers, many Iranians are worried that with his arrival in the White House, there may actually be no more room for deals. Now, among the hardliners who aren't into dealing with the U.S. to begin with, it is business as usual. At the Friday prayers in Tehran today, Trump wasn't mentioned by name, and that in itself seemed to be the message, because for most in that crowd, it doesn't matter who leads the U.S., it still cannot be trusted. Meanwhile, Iranian leaders remained silent on Inauguration Day, but in what is probably one of the more charitable comments from them this week, Foreign Minister Javad Zarif said that he would reserve judgment on Trump, despite the long history of distrust between the two countries. Now, just over eight years ago, Barack Obama sent a direct video message to the Iranian people promising diplomacy. Now, Iranians differ on how that turned out, but they know not to expect the same tone from Trump. Peter. All right, Nala, thank you. Nala's in Tehran tonight. While we're talking about different perspectives on today's inauguration, take a look at a few from up high. This is a view of the National Mall here in Washington in the hour before Trump took the oath of office. The crowd mostly at the front. But compare that to the same angle, same hour, at Barack Obama's first inauguration. And you see the difference. Speaking of Obama, this is the last shot from his White House photographer as he flew out of Washington. The simple caption, farewell. Former President George H.W. Bush watched the inauguration from a Houston hospital bed. The 92-year-old has been in the ICU receiving treatment for pneumonia. Today, a family spokesperson said he's now breathing on his own. Former First Lady Barbara Bush was admitted to the same hospital. On Wednesday, she has bronchitis and will be kept in hospital over the weekend as a precaution. We'll have much more on the inauguration in just a few moments. But first, a quick look at some other stories that are making the news tonight. Starting with the thick smoke that filled Vancouver's skyline today. A fire started on an auto scrapyard on Mitchell Island between Vancouver and Richmond. At times, the smoke was thick enough to blot out the sun. 
firefighters eventually got it under control but are still investigating the cause. In Italy, there were some remarkable scenes at the site of this week's devastating avalanche. Today, 10 people were found alive. Four children and a woman had taken refuge in an air pocket near the hotel's kitchen. More than 30 people were inside the building when a wall of snow slammed into it late Wednesday. There have been four confirmed deaths. Notorious Mexican drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman appeared in a New York court today. He pleaded not guilty to 17 charges, accusing him of running the world's largest drug trafficking ring. Guzman was extradited from Mexico to the United States last night. A movie at the center of an animal welfare investigation has now canceled its Hollywood premiere. This video, reportedly shot on the Winnipeg set of A Dog's Purpose, was posted online yesterday. It seems to show a distressed German shepherd being pushed into a turbulent pool of water. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have announced plans to move to London. They'll leave their house in Norfolk after Prince William's job as an air ambulance helicopter pilot wraps this summer. They'll base themselves at Kensington Palace as Will and Kate assume more royal duties. And Prince George will begin school in London this fall. Well, straight ahead, more on this historic day in the U.S. Capitol and the team that will help President Trump run the country. The men and women that Donald Trump has chosen to sit in his cabinet are currently undergoing confirmation hearings, though some have made statements to the Senate that go directly against what Trump has said on the campaign trail. Trump says together they'll help form 
one of the best administrations ever. Trump hasn't strayed far from his comfort zone when it comes to his cabinet. It resembles most of the boardrooms in the biggest companies in the U.S. Very male, very white, very rich. If we could run our country the way I've run my company, we would have a country that you would be so proud of. It would appear he's trying to do just that. His nominees for top cabinet positions include several multimillionaires, even two billionaires. Many of his picks were born wealthy, went to elite schools. Most have no experience in government. They are, in general, protectionist, highly skeptical that climate change is man-made or even exists. And for the first time in a quarter century, none of the top four seats will be occupied by a woman or a visible minority. The pick for Secretary of State, the top diplomat, is Rex Tillerson. CEO of ExxonMobil, he has no political experience. He does have extensive business ties to Russia. He's a good pal of, wait for it, Vladimir Putin. He was even awarded the Russian Order of Friendship three years ago, something Republican Senator Lindsey Graham at the time called unnerving. We are going to appoint Mad Dog Mattis as our Secretary of Defense. That's right, the pick for Defense Secretary is nicknamed Mad Dog. He spent 41 years in the military, overseeing the U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. In 2005, he drew criticism after making these comments at a public forum. Actually, it's a lot of fun to fight them. You know, it's a hell of a move. Uh, it's fun to shoot some people if you want to come you like brawling. I would bring back waterboarding, and I'd bring back a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding. But it turns out Mattis does not favor waterboarding. Mattis is also at odds with his boss on the Iran nuclear deal. Trump has said it should be dismantled. Mattis says, while it's not perfect, there's no going back. For the third time, Treasury will have a former Goldman Sachs banker at its helm. Observers have called Steve Mnuchin the least controversial of the nominees. Strangely enough, Mnuchin, born into wealth as well, was mostly a donor to the Democratic Party before he was tapped for cabinet. Oh, and Trump once sued Mnuchin's own hedge fund company. Dune Capital Management was among a group of lenders who provided loans for the construction of a Trump skyscraper in Chicago. The suit was settled. Jeff Sessions is Trump's pick for attorney general, named after Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederate States of America during the Civil War, and Civil War General Pierre Beauregard. He was the first senator who endorsed Trump for president, and who, in his 20 years in the Senate, opposed immigration reform, voting protections for minorities, and once voted against an amendment banning cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment of prisoners. Oh, yeah. hey, there, Sessions brings a lot of baggage with him. Back in 1986, he was up for a federal judgeship. His former colleagues helped derail that, testifying to a Senate committee that as U.S. attorney, Sessions used the N-word and joked about the Ku Klux Klan saying he thought they were okay until he learned that they smoked marijuana. I am not a racist. I am not insensitive to blacks. Dude, wait a minute, you can't arrest me, I'm white. White people don't get arrested. Last week, his Senate confirmation hearing was interrupted multiple times by protesters, but none of it seemed to phase his supporters. And that's just the top jobs. Trump has also nominated an education secretary who's advocated heavily for charter schools and called for entire public school systems to be shut down. An energy secretary who once called for the energy department to be dismantled. And a health and human services secretary who wants to slash Medicare and Medicaid, defund Planned Parenthood, and is against a woman's right to choose. I think we have one of the great cabinets ever put together. Well, there's a lot of debate about that. Joining us again tonight, Jennifer Carroll, former Lieutenant Governor of Florida and a key Trump supporter. You know some of these people, you know all of most of them. Uh, 
is he telling the real story when he says they're one of the greatest cabinets ever put together? Well, they're all intelligent in their own right. The key is going to be how well can they work with the Congress to get the initiatives passed. That is going to be the hang-up for Donald Trump. And do you think it's going to be a challenge? It will be a challenge because the Congress is going to have... Many of the, the Republican congressional members and a lot of the Democrat congressional members will want to teach him a lesson, that he cannot do it all on his own, that he's going to need to come through them. Now, some of the key members of this potential cabinet in the hearings said things that were directly opposite to what Trump said in the campaign. How can you make that work? It makes you wonder that yeah. are they just saying that to get confirmed and then afterwards do whatever he tells them to do? If it is, in fact, that they differ with him and he's fine with them differing with him, that's a good thing because that means that he will maybe be receptive to, to differing views. But at the end of the day, they're going to do what he, he tells them to do. Is there one in there that you think we should keep our eye on that might be a surprise? No surprise. But the, the Congress, as it stands, can uh, support and pass all of his nominees through, the Democrats are trying to make a point. But the Democrats really need to keep their powder dry and pick their fights, because right. there will be a lot more fights coming. All right. Jennifer, thanks very much. Thank it's been you. great having you with us. Thanks. Week. Well, when we come back, a cautionary tale about President Trump from neighbors of his golf club in Scotland. There's been a concerted campaign of bullying and intimidation against the residents on the estate. That story and more just ahead on The National in Washington. But first, to look at the day's business numbers, the TSX rose 138 points. The Canadian dollar moved down slightly. In New York, the Dow gained 94 points. Price of oil rose $1.05 a barrel.
begin working on an impenetrable, physical, tall, powerful, beautiful southern border wall. Build a wall and make them pay for it. It's one of Donald Trump's most divisive ideas, but it isn't new. He's actually done it before. No, not on the border with Mexico, rather at his golf course in northern Scotland. The CBC's Margaret Evans brings us that story tonight. Nature unleashed. Scotland's rugged coastline coming head to head with the North Sea. Powerful forces at work. It's a place of hard and relentless beauty, proud like the Scots themselves. But along this stretch of coast just north of Aberdeen, you'll find a field in which there flies not a Scottish flag, but a Mexican one. It's a message for a man who came from America and in the end didn't get everything he wanted, even if he is now to be the President of the United States. I'm watching great. Susan Monroe and her husband have lived in this farmhouse for more than two decades now, raising their children here. I like staying here. I do, I do. I don't know where I'd get another little house down by the sea. They'd lived in relative harmony, she says, with nature and their neighbours until the arrival of Donald J. Trump about 10 years ago, walking down her road on his own, fresh from purchasing the surrounding land. He was out for a stool just looking at what he'd just bought, and that was about it. And I thought, oh, well, seems all right. Until things took a turn for the worse. When you're up the hill behind the Monroes, you can see the Trump clubhouse in the distance. But at ground level, their views have been blocked on two sides, by earthen walls built up by Trump International when the Monroes refused to sell their land. And so this gate... I was quite surprised that went in because it was a right away. There was a road right down uh, into the dunes, through the dunes, right down to the beach, which a lot of people used. You do get sort of the sense of claustrophobia here. You're oh, quite... Oh, it's awful. Uh, it's awful. Surrounded Just feel as if bit. I'm in prison now. After yeah. having all... I mean, being here for so many years, 25 years of lovely views and space, and now I've got yeah. president-elect... The Trump International Golf Links in Aberdeenshire formally opened in 2012. A family affair with much fanfare, playing up Donald Trump's Scottish heritage on his mother's side. Nothing will ever be built around it because I own all the land around it. It's nice to own land. Scottish authorities courted the investment, a chance to diversify a local economy so long dependent on the fortunes of North Sea oil. James Bream is with the Chamber of Commerce. And we have a, a world-class golf course. Um, it's in the top 100 in the world. Uh, we have a, a fantastic new hotel which uh, provides fine dining in the course and f uh, facilities uh, provide employment for over 100 people. So the, the development is significant in a regional sense. But it fell far short of what Trump promised to invest in exchange for planning permission. $1.5 billion to include a second golf course, holiday homes, and 6,000 jobs. So significant that authorities brushed aside environmental concerns. The golf course was built on ancient dunes, protected as a site of scientific interest. A diamond in the rough, say activists, and no place for quaint thoroughfares and gentrified clocks. So this is the dune system as it was before Mr. Trump bought it, and indeed... Martin Ford is a local councillor who cast the deciding vote against the golf course in 2008, only to have Edinburgh intervene in Trump's favour. This was based upon using a, a, a natural environment, an irreplaceable resource of which we have very little left, for a billionaire's vanity project to provide high-end entertainment so people could fly across the Atlantic to play a game of golf. It's not sustainable. It was also a piece of localised environmental vandalism. Ford says it still wasn't enough land. Trump's lawyers trying to convince the government to appropriate properties from people like Susan Monroe when pressure tactics didn't work. 
Trump himself even got involved in some public mudslinging. Go down and take a look at how badly maintained that piece of property is. It's disgusting. Design bullying, says Ford. has been a concerted campaign of bullying and intimidation against the residents on the estate with the express intention of forcing them out of their homes. One homeowner was even reportedly sent the bill for a fence erected by Trump's people. Thus the solidarity with Mexico up here. Donald Trump also tried to block a wind farming project just off the coast here, arguing that the turbines would block his golfers' views of the sea. When Britain's highest court ruled against him, the Trump company issued a statement calling wind energy a dangerous experiment and the Scottish government of the day foolish, small-minded and parochial. Not perhaps the best way to make friends and influence people, at least not here. Ask around at one of the local watering holes in the village of Balmedi, next to the golf course, and people will tell you they were with Trump to begin with. I thought it was good to start with because he's taking money in the community and stuff, but what he did, a few people trying to get land and stuff, wasn't very nice, but... It changed opinions fast. I mean, it is surreal because we're a little village in Aberdeen, in Scotland, and we've got a president, it's got a golf course next to us. It's a big difference between somebody getting uh, bullied out of their house and the fact that this guy now has his finger on the nuclear button. Scotland's political elites are certainly a lot more wary, their fingers well and truly singed, none more so than Alex Salmond, Scotland's former right, first right. minister. I mean, my main problem with uh, Donald Trump, as far as the golf course is concerned, is he didn't deliver what he promised. Salmond went from being Trump's best friend to mad Alex after he refused to cancel the wind farm or force people to sell their land. Some say Trump is just looking for an excuse to get out of a bad investment, the best golf course in the world, reportedly losing money. Salmon believes it's more the about sour grapes and payback. As soon as Donald, somebody says no to Donald, then he, he, he goes totally uh, into, the, into the stratosphere. And the hope that we all must have is that the awesome responsibility of office actually changes someone's character, because that bit of the character is a real dangerous to us all. What lies ahead for the wild dunes or the locals who took on Trump and won a victory of sorts is anybody's guess now that the golf course down the road essentially belongs to one of the most powerful leaders on the planet. It's in the wind, as they say. And Susan Monroe is hoping all the trouble will eventually just disappear under those shifting sands. Just have to wait and see. I don't know what will happen now he's going to be president. I mean, we'll see less of him. Or maybe not. Those powerful forces work in mysterious ways. And there's always a pot of gold, after all, to be chased at the end of the rainbow. Margaret Evans, CBC News, near Aberdeen. The golf course near Aberdeen is one of 17 that Donald Trump owns around the world. And it's easily one of the most controversial. That $1.5 billion investment has shrunk considerably to $50 million. A luxury hotel wasn't built, an existing one was refurbished, and the timeshare apartments haven't appeared. Oh, and in case you're wondering, Trump owns a course right here in Washington as well. Up next, the plans for a huge anti-Trump protest in Washington tomorrow, and why Canadian women are taking part.
Donald Trump has promised to unite his country, but a massive protest tomorrow will serve as a reminder of just how divided it is. Hundreds of thousands of women are expected to march against Trump's positions on equality and abortion. Our Ioana Remiliotis spoke with some of the Canadians who plan on being there. It's not that they want to go as much as they feel they have to. On a long, grueling bus ride to march, protest and protect. We decided to attend the march in D.C. because I think it has a relevance that the Toronto march doesn't have. We should double check the weather. Like so many who signed up to go to Washington, Krista Oliver and her daughter Olivia are first-time activists and reluctant ones. It doesn't feel like inspired as much as horrified. <laughs> His position and rhetoric uh, made me feel like it was time to get off the couch and make sure that we don't roll back into the previous century. Grab him by the from what was dubbed P-gate to his denials of allegations of sexual assault. I have no idea who these women are. You've called women you don't like fat pigs. Trump has been widely called out on his offensive and sexist remarks about women. The outrage has spilled across borders. Marissa McTasney tapped into it. McTasney and a team of volunteers are organizing the buses and the march kits for the largest Canadian contingent going, about 200 women. They range from teens to seniors. We also have grandmothers who thought they were done, and they're realizing our work is not finished yet. There's no doubt Trump has galvanized the feminist movement. The women's march is going to be massive. But organizers frame it as something more than a huge anti-Trump event. I think it's really important that we have a louder voice saying equality matters, diversity matters, inclusion matters. Here's your maple leaf. That voice will be historic on scale alone. 200,000 people are expected to attend the march in D.C. that will end with a rally on Capitol Hill. And while the Canadian contribution is small, it's scrappy. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. And organizers say every demonstrator counts. The incoming president seems to respond to things like ratings and popularity and, and maybe numbers will speak to him as nothing else seems to. It's why 18-year-old Olivia Alexander jumped at the chance to join her mom. Just as a young woman, like going out to the, like Washington and be, being able to like voice my opinion, I don't know, it, it feels weirdly uplifting, like I'm trying to make some change. Yeah. Let's do it together. <laughs> it's empowering already, and they plan to chronicle it all on Instagram including the two nights they'll spend on a bus getting there and back. If I can have any kind of impact and all I had to do was give up a weekend and not be able to have a shower for two nights, I think that's worth it. Worth it, they say, if it means being part of a voice that refuses to be silent and only intends to get louder. Joanna Brumiliotis, CBC News, Toronto. We'll have coverage of the March tomorrow. But up next, a final look at this historic day in the U.S. Capitol.
Well, so many of the people who crowded into the National Mall this morning were there to hear from the man they voted for. Here's what some of Donald Trump's supporters had to say about today's inauguration. What are you expecting for today? I'm just expecting a lot of excitement, a lot of patriotism, and the country coming together for the good of the whole. Everybody is American. We're all Americans at the end of the day. This moment is your moment. It belongs to you. I'm anticipating the best four years that we're going to have in America. I'm here to hopefully enjoy my values for once, well, for the first time in eight years being represented. The United States of America is your country. I am very proud that we've got our country back again. A lot of us need a change. We were thinking we were going to get hope and change eight years ago, and really, a lot of Americans did not get it. The time for empty talk is over. Trump can do things that nobody else can do. He can go, he won't be afraid of nobody. And see, I love capitalism, and he's a great capitalist. We will follow two simple rules. Buy American and hire American. I don't believe that he has a, it's a black and white thing. It's actually an American. We need to make America a great again. All lives matter, not just black lives. I really believe he's going to support everyone. And I'm hoping that he supports not just half of America, but all of America. Whether we are black or brown or white, we all bleed the same red blood of patriots. And I really believe that it's time that we unify as a country and come together and support our president because we're all in the same boat. It's a historic event. I'm just so pleased to be able to be here with my family and uh, just partake of a piece of history. I will fight for you with every breath in my body, and I will never, ever let you down. Thank you. President Donald Trump and some of his supporters. That's the Nationalist Friday night, an extraordinary day here in Washington. Thanks to our hosts here at the Canadian Embassy. For news at any hour, you can always go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.